In the letter to the Hebrews, we read these words in chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith our ancestors received approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. And in verse, verses 8 through 16, we read, By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he set out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed for a time in the land he had been promised, as in a foreign land, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, he received power of procreation, even though he was too old. And Sarah herself was barren, because he considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one person, and this one as good as dead, descendants were born, as many as the stars of heaven and as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. All of these died in faith without, re without having received the promises, but from a distance they saw and greeted them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth. For people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land that they had left behind, they could have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed, he prepared a city for them. On August 28th, 1963, 250,000 people, a quarter of a million, gathered before the Lincoln Memorial, and they heard these words from Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. I still have a dream. It is a de dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. This is our hope. This is our faith that I will go back to the South with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to climb up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning, my country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. On April 3rd, 1968, the night before his assassination in Memphis, Tennessee, Dr. King said these words. Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. 
But it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. And I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go to the mountaintop and I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not go there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Good morning. And good morning to all those who are listening to us this morning online. This morning is a first for me. Despite knowing, worshiping, praying, and working on boards and committees for many years together, this is the first morning, the first time, that Paul and I are sharing together as leaders in a Sunday worship experience. Paul, it is an honor and one I shall not forget. Thank you. The assurance of things not seen. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. This morning, we're going to explore scripture found in the letter to the Hebrews and words spoken by Dr. Martin Luther King as they speak to faith and the assurance that something we hope for will happen. Let's begin briefly by giving some background to today's scripture from Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11 is the foremost faith chapter of all scripture, first by defining faith and then using by example well-known biblical characters to show faith in action. These people heard God's promises and believed them despite waiting a very long time to see the promises fulfilled, some promises never having been fulfilled in their lifetime. Walt Disney died before Disneyland, or Disney World, I should say, was completed in Florida. Soon after its completion, many commented, isn't it too bad that Walt didn't live to see this? And to that, the reply was and has been, he did see it. That's why it's here. If we had visited Orlando when he built Disney World, we would have seen only fields and orchards and swamps. But Walt Disney saw boats and trains and children Disney World exists because he saw it. It's, it is real to us today only because it was first real to Walt Disney in that tire, tireless work ethic and wonderful, hope for, imagine of his. Now hear again those words from Hebrews 11, this time from the NIV tr translation. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Now, some people scoff at Christians because we live by faith, because we believe that which we cannot see, because we are assured of things for which we can only hope and are convinced of that which we cannot see. They call us otherworldly, and though they are usually very polite to listen to us, they oftentimes give little weight to our foundational belief. They say, you know, 
in reality, you only go around once, and can't you see that? Grasp all the likings of this world you can get. And to that we reply, we just don't go around once. There is something more, and we have seen it. God has revealed it to us. It abides in our minds and in our hearts. The best is yet to come. And yet some people will still say, you see, I only believe what I see. And when they say that, they mean they believe only which they can test with their five senses, which they can see, hear, taste, touch, and smell. They mean that they will accept only that which has been examined in a test tube or measured, or dissected, or verified by experiment. And to that I say, how short-sighted. All of the great scientists have been people of great vision, people who saw in their minds that which they could only hope someday to verify in a laboratory. Einstein predicted many strange and wonderful things that scientists are still verifying decades later. Yet when it comes to faith and its institution, the question always remains, what is real? Is the God in whom we believe real? Or is the only world in which we can touch and verify real? That's the question we hear outside the walls of this church. And at times, maybe in our own hearts. 4,000 years ago, or thereabouts, God called Abraham to leave his hometown and go to a place that God would show him. God did not show him a brochure with pictures of the promised land. Abraham was not like the American settlers who dreamed of free land and abundant gold. No, Abraham left his home and departed on a lifetime journey, not because he believed in gold, but because he believed in God. God promised Abraham that he would make a great nation of him, but the fulfillment of the promise was a long time in coming. When Abraham and Sarah arrived in the promised land, they did not even have a permanent house. They could, only buy, they could buy only a burial plot in that foreign land. They could only look forward to the great city whose maker and builder was God. Abraham and Sarah became older and older. Not only had God not made them a great nation, but he had not even given them a son. The time for childbearing had passed for them. They did not even have a child. Isn't God sometimes like that? We wait and we pray and we wonder, where is God? Has God heard? Will God answer? Why hasn't God answered by now? So what is real? Was Abraham's faith real? Was his hope real? Or did that all become real when his son Isaac was born? No, for Abraham, it was real well before Isaac was born. Years before God had said it, Abraham believed it. Even though the years made the fulfillment of the promise less and less likely, Abraham never stopped believing or obeying God. Abraham was convinced that nothing was so real as God. Because of his faith, Abraham was certain of that for which he had hoped, and he was convinced of that which he had only dreamed. And finally, the dream became a reality, not because Abraham had dreamed it, but because God had promised it. And now, on this special Sunday, let's consider the words 
of Martin Luther King, read earlier by Paul. You see, the spring and summer of 1963 proved to be one of the most important times of the civil rights movement. In April 1963, there was a protest against widespread discrimination in the downtown depart department stores of, of Birmingham, Alabama. The demonstration culminated in Dr. King's arrest and substantial media coverage of the police violence against the demonstrators, both of which catapulted both the civil rights movement and Dr. King into the national spotlight as never before. While jailed in April, Dr. King wrote his letter from Birmingham jail, a document that outlined the need and the goals for direct action campaigns to combat racism. In June, two months later, NAACP leader Medgar Evers was assassinated. The acclaim that Dr. King's letter from the Birmingham jail received and the horror of Medgar Ever, Evers' killing foreshadowed the success, the successful reaction in August 1963 to King's profound speech at the Washington, Washington D.C. Mall. While King's Lincoln Memorial speech is best remembered for his vision of racial equality. In fact, its true import lies in the fact that the speech helped advance the multifaceted goals of the Washington, D.C. March, thus securing the support of President Kennedy and paving the way for passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Were Martin Luther King's hope for dreams and mountaintop experience real? Or did they just make good speaker rhetoric at well-attended gatherings? The truth and the evidence now clearly shows that Dr. King's hopes and dreams were not only real, but that God's promises were and continue to be real as well. For the last 60 years, King's hopes and dreams continue to be recited throughout our land and are now embedded in our culture and are beginning to become a reality. There has been some progress, but the hard work of tearing down racism continues, and not without ongoing tragedy, inequity, and a separation that denies all humanity the life-giving potential that a diverse and integrated world can provide. But here again, here again the words found in Hebrews, this time from the New Jerusalem Bible. Only faith can guarantee the blessings that we hope for or prove the existence of realities that are unseen. Today, Martin Luther King's hopes and dreams are still not a full reality. We do not know how or when they will be realized or in what form they will take. But we do know now that King's hopes and dreams were real and will be answered because of God's love, God's purpose, and Dr. King's faith that were, was aligned with God. But if we don't know when our hopes will be realized or even know what form they will take, how do we keep them alive? Let's be truthful. We've all asked ourselves that question. When we don't know what form they'll take or when they will take place, how do we keep them alive? The, under, the answer to that is to understand that hope is as much a verb as it is a noun. Hope is not a sit around on a couch and wait kind of thing. Hope is a dynamic process of faith involving the active pursuit of goals, a determination of how to reach those goals, and the willpower to see them to, to fruition. The future is an infinite succession of each moment, and to live now one's hope, one's expectation, according to God's love and one's aligned faith is itself faith with life. And Martin Luther King's life is testimony to that, each and every word. 
Martin Luther King's work, ministry, and words reveal that faith, combined with hope, is an active process. This is the great lesson for us and this country today. Now let's consider a moment for our church. This church has will willingly opened its hearts to the heart of God. We have opened our minds to the mind of God and our intentions to the purposes of God. We have not stopped listening. We have not stopped praying. We have not yield, yielded to a simpler way. We know that God is present in our undertakings. We know that God has and continues to answer us. Our faith journey over these past six years has borne fruit. Today, we not only have hope, but we as a faith community can now firmly declare that this church, whatever form it takes, will be open to all people from all walks of life who yearn to join and pursue freedom, safety, and a life-giving faith. And though we cannot see ahead, there is a certainty, a promise, in what we hope for. Let me conclude with my thoughts for each of us listening here today. No matter where life finds you, Standing here, I cannot prove to you or for anybody outside these walls that God is real. But what I can say to each of us and to those persons outside the walls is that you can come to know God is real in the same way that Martin Luther King and Abraham did. And let me offer this suggestion for each of us, myself. As you go about reflecting on your life and creating hopes for your future in the next days, weeks, and months ahead, give God a chance. Give God a chance to show you how real God really is. Give over to faith in God. Give over to trust in God, and you will experience God. The words of Martin Luther King and the writer of Hebrews are still true today, and that goes for each of us individually, this church, and for all those outside the walls of this church. That faith is, faith is, the assurance of things hoped for, or as some translations state, proof of things not seen. It will take work. It may be a struggle. But we can all live with the certainty that what we hope for is waiting for us and this church. We may not know what will happen today or our many tomorrows. But like Martin Luther King, we need not be concerned. We just need to continue with faith and hope and do what God has purposed for our lives in this church. We may not live to experience that which by faith we hope for, but God will allow us, as he did Martin Luther King, to walk to the mountaintop and show us the promised land. Amen. There's a world at war, caught in suffering, silent casualties, oh God grant us peace. In these sleepless nights, I can hardly breathe, despite brutality, I know 
that we'll be free. I know that we'll be free. Let the light in keep it shining. Let it break into the darkness. All the love dares us to see. We'll all be free. In these desperate times, love will hold us. Love will join our hands, teach us to have no fear. So we lay our head down to wash them.